You're now listening to Alpha Leak, a podcast mini series highlighting the most under the radar projects and developments in crypto. And this series is brought to you by the Blockcrunch Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Choi. I'm a general partner at Spartan Capital and an active DeFi angel investor. Nothing on this show should be construed as financial advice, and my guests, myself, and my employer may hold positions and assets discussed on the show. And if you'd like for your project to be featured on this series, reach out to me on Twitter at Mr. Jason Choi. This episode is also brought to you by Paraswap. Stick around to learn more. This episode is also sponsored by the HBAR Foundation. This episode is also brought to you by Notional Finance. I like to use Notional Finance to get transparent, fixed rate borrowing and lending on Ethereum. The upgraded and easy to use V2 with token and liquidity mining is also live now at notional.finance slash blockcrunch. So stick around to learn more. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Blockcrunch podcast. Now, in this week's episode, we are discussing a really, really exciting event happening in DeFi, which is a massive vampire attack. And the project behind this is Enso Finance, and it lets users create so-called social meta strategies on chain, which we'll discuss what they are. And now they're launching a vampire attack on six different DeFi protocols. So in other words, they are taking full advantage of DeFi's openness and snatching liquidity and users from various protocols. So to me, this is one of the more exciting things to happen in DeFi lately. And I'm excited to learn more about what Enso does, how they want to pull off this vampire attack, and the implications about open source innovation in DeFi. And as a disclaimer, Spartan is an investor in Enso. So to talk about this, I'm really excited to be joined by Connor Howe, the developer and founder of Enso. So welcome to the show, Connor. Thanks for having me, Jason. Yeah. So just before we get started, I'm curious, you know, what attracted you to this circus, this this crazy world that is crypto? Yeah. um, So back in 2013, I ran a lot of bot farms on World of Warcraft and RuneScape. So I'd level up these accounts. I would farm herbs in RuneScape, for example. They were very lucrative at that point. I'd be then selling this for more gold, more accounts, build up the the bot farm. And it got to a stage where these mule accounts were, were full and uh, bans were were coming in all the time so we started to to diversify into crypto actually at that point for selling and buying these accounts then i got heavily into ethereum in 2016 where i wrote one of the uk's first um ethereum research papers actually so i built a dap back in 2016 very different space then and very kind of isolated where people built their own dapps without interacting with others and nowadays it's completely open. So that's kind of how, how I got into it. And there's a lot of philosophical beliefs that we should have an open financial system where people can fully see what others are doing and have the full traceability. Absolutely. And I think a lot of that um, philosophy around creating an open and composable system is going to come into discussion very quickly when we talk about the vampire attack and what it is and how it's pulled off. Um, so let's talk about what you're building now. So you're building a project called Enso. Um, and it focuses on something called meta strategy. So for people who are not as familiar or they haven't come across and so yet, can you talk about what the product does and what exactly is a meta strategy? Sure. Um, so strategy itself is created by anyone on the platform. This can be an individual, a DAO or a multisig. A strategy is comprised of any ERC20 token. This token could be not limited to an LP pool, a gauge, a wrap token, a base asset, and these are deposited into the contract generating yield. And this is called a strategy. So other people are able to invest into this strategy and the creator is able to take a performance fee from the top. Now, a meta strategy is when you combine multiple strategy tokens into another strategy. So for example, I can create a strategy based upon LP pool tokens and curve. I can create another one that's very risk averse, maybe stable coin farming, and I can bring both respective tokens into one strategy and we call this a, a meta strategy. So if I like your investment strategy, I could bring your strategy token into mine. And by doing that, whatever changes you do within your strategy, I will still get the exposure to. So. It's bundling it all together in one place and having one unified UI where anyone and everyone can create a strategy. And just for people who haven't seen the uh, the product yet, is it kind of a drag and drop UI where people can pick different strategies and create their own stack? Um, or how does it work? <clears throat> yep. So the user comes to the platform, they go to the create button, um, they select how much ether they'd like to start it off with. 
if they would like it to be public or private, public meaning anyone can invest, you can also set a whitelist on top of addresses that are able to invest. If you want to have a performance fee, you can set the performance fee from zero all the way up to 100 if you wish. Again, we believe in an open, transparent world where people should use their own somewhat common sense as to what is a good investment. So for example, if someone has a 90% performance fee, maybe it's not the most lucrative, um, but we don't believe in putting limits around people as to what they can and cannot do. Regarding the creation itself, you select the base assets, then you can nest these farms. So let's say DAI, you can then deposit this into compound, CDAI, you can take CDAI, then you can put it into another farm and then take that LP pool token and put it into another farm. It's very simplistic. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that we've spent um, a large majority of our time on these designs. We've done the third iteration now, full revamp of the application. We work with a, a UX agency that does IKEA and SBB Mobile, which is uh, the national train app within Switzerland. So we put the user centric at the first because it's complicated underneath that we need everyone and anyone to be able to do it. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I'm most excited for about in DeFi as well, which is this kind of abstraction of complexity, right? I think when I first looked at Curve and like Convex, there are these like CVXCR, uh, USDC or like USDT. There are so many different assets that are very hard for non-crypto natives to understand. So this abstraction thesis makes a ton of sense. And I'm curious, so in terms of what types of people will use these meta strategies, it sounds like you might be not just targeting crypto natives, but also people who might be relatively newer to crypto. Is, is that right? Yep, that's true. So it's a, built, it's a tool built for people who are native um, and who also have the DeFi experience. So they'll be able to do their arbitrary farms that only deployed one hour ago. Um, if you're more new to crypto, then you, you can just have exposure to the base assets on Ethereum at the beginning. Um, so it's kind of catered to whatever the user group they're looking for and also treasuries. So treasuries can manage their assets in a more effective way instead of building smart contract calls to all the other platforms and going to five, six different UIs. They can now do it all through one unified place. So do you foresee maybe DAO treasuries being a bigger uh, source of capital for Enso than say like retail users like me? I would love it to be retail, honestly. Um, I would love crypto sweaters to put their mouth, kind of their money where their mouth is actually, because I think a lot of traders nowadays say they buy this token and they just throw 10, 10 tokens out on their Twitter. <clears throat> Six months later say, oh, I said buy this. Um, <laughs> this happens all the time. So I would love to see a strategy built by one of these individuals and for them to prove that they bought it at this price point and to see the performance over time. So. I would love it to be more retail for individual traders, but it's not limited to that. It can also be investment DAOs, for example, maybe the Lao. It can also be multi-sigs. Um, it can be treasuries wishing to manage their funds all within one simple place. Yeah, and Connor, you mentioned this kind of social aspect to it. Uh, for instance, like these Twitter influencers maybe managing a public portfolio. And in the past, there have been other projects that kind of do this as well. And obviously there was, I think most recently uh, was DHedge, uh, where there are like these public profiles and mon um, doing different portfolios, which people can subscribe to on chain. Um, so can you help us walk through, you know, what about the social aspect interests you the most? Are there like analogies in the Web2 world that you've seen work that gets you excited? Or how do you think about that? Sure. I think a lot of it comes down to retention on the platform. So we've built gamification in the background as well. It's very rudimentary nowadays to have a leaderboard. Um, we have this as well. So people psychologically want to compete. So they want to have the, a higher rank in the leaderboard. It's the same as video games. I think this is why a lot of people play nowadays. Regarding the gamification element, people are able to join tournaments and compete with each other. So for example, we will have the whole Enso community about one month after launch where they will challenge each other and whoever is the most profitable with their strategy over the course of X days, then they will get the prize pool. Another great example of this, I can challenge you one versus one for who's the most profitable over X period of time. So the social element, we're bringing in more gamification in the background and we hope that people will, will kind of show their, their traits and will compete with each other. 
Absolutely. And I'd love to kind of pivot a little bit to talk about the, the spicier aspect of today's discussion, which is this vampire attack that you're launching on six <laughs> protocols. So I think on the day of recording, a day before, uh, there were some press coverage, but not much detail has been given about exactly how this is pulled off yet. So can you tell us, you know, exactly what is a vampire attack, first of all, and, and what type of protocols are you targeting? Sure. Um, so this was first introduced by SushiSwap last year. SushiSwap forked Uniswap 141 offered very lucrative incentives for migrating your LP tokens from Uni over to Sushi. By migrating the LP tokens, they burned the LP, took the underlying, and put it into a one-to-one -one LP on the Sushi sites. They were able to accomplish, I think, 1.5 billion. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they'd done really good. And this kick-started the community. And the Sushi community is one of the strongest right now within the space. And this aligned the incentives very quickly for the early users for joining the platform. And it was similar minded individuals on Uniswap LP pools that could join SushiSwap. So we're doing the same, but we're doing it to six people. <laughs> um, we're not forking anyone. We've built all our own core contracts. They've been audited as well by Chain Security. And we've built migration tools. This is similar to a mobile phone provider. So if you have a mobile phone provider of BT and Vodafone want you to move over, they'll say, we'll give you some credit for moving over. So we're doing the exact same, but we're doing it to six people that have a similar concept. These six people are Index Corp, Token Sets, PyDAO, DHedge, PowerPool, and Indexed, which I feel bad for Index because <clears throat> they recently got hacked to think they're a great team but we built this about four months ago. So the way that this will work, um, you'll go to a fully gamified UI. We want to bring game, gamified DeFi really into DeFi 2.0, where people are able to stake their index tokens. Let's take DPI, for example, from Index Co. They stake this four weeks later. We have the right to call a contract. This contract will then burn the index token, take the underlying, which has comp XYZ with inside, and then move over to a one to one ENSO strategy. Now, up for grabs, there's about seven, eight hundred million TVL available. This is not limited to eight hundred million because people can buy more indexes. By doing this, we bring early users that believe in a similar concept. Indexes are a basket of assets. Most of these platforms are raw ERC20 tokens. But by having this similar mindset of baskets of assets, then we can bring them over to Enso. And this will kickstart the platform, kickstart the user base, and we'll be giving NFTs as well for the rewards of people migrating. We will also be giving native governance tokens as well for kickstarting the community and aligning the incentives. And yeah, we, we think it'll be a lot of fun to see how users react, how much TVL has been migrated from previous holdings, from new holdings. Yeah, I think it'll be very interesting. <laughs> yeah, and are these NFTs and native governance tokens only given to people who migrate or is it given to you know people who purchase a new products on top of Enso as well? So for the Vampire Attack, the NFTs are only available for people who migrate. The governance tokens will be rewarded to people who migrate. After the migration has happened and the platform's kickstarted, we have incentives for users <clears throat> continuously building on top of Enso. So for example, creating strategies, investing into other strategies, rebalancing, restructuring, and uh, creating meta strategies. There's some nice incentives underneath to keep the interest aligned. Yeah, and this is such a crazy idea, I think, especially for people who are not in crypto, because you know when someone wants to build like a Facebook competitor, all of Facebook's social graph is private, right? Um, and when you see companies start to build on top of Twitter, you know, Twitter can shut off their APIs at any time if they think that whoever's building on top of them is competitive. But in crypto, you can just look on chain at who the users are on all these products that are directly competitive. And then you can just, you know, launch a vampire attack. So I, I'm really curious, you know, are you worried eventually that someone else would do the same to, to Enzo? I, I welcome it. Why not? It's fair game. Um, this helps us innovate faster. This helps the ecosystem grow more. If we're constantly not competing, but more pushing each other for developing better products and who can retain the most users will be the end game. I think there w is space for multiple index protocols, multiple strategy protocols. 
And I, I welcome people to do it because if you do it, then we will start feeling the pressure and we will start building faster and we'll start innovating more. And, and I hope this happens to the other platforms because I think it, it, it's a great concept. But I think there's some areas missing, such as fully permissionless creation. Um, there's also missing of what assets can and cannot be used. We don't believe in whitelisting assets. We believe that people should learn from their own mistakes. So, for example, when a child rides a bicycle, generally they learn by falling off, scraping their knees and getting back up and going again. Whereas I, I see the world that a lot of platforms nowadays are limiting as to what can and cannot be used. So, yeah, I welcome anyone to do it. Um, feel free. Please do a lot of good gamification on the user interface. That's where the fun comes from. And yeah, let's let's play. <laughs> now, before I continue, I'd love to share one of my favorite products in crypto with you. Now, whenever I want to trade a token, instead of going to Uniswap, SushiSwap, Bancor, one by one to see where I can find the best quote, I just go to Paraswap to scan for the best price anywhere. Because Paraswap aggregates all the popular Ethereum DEXs and saves me a ton of time and headache in finding where I can trade something for the best price and lets me trade in one place. Now, the cool thing is they've also integrated with Ledger Live as well, meaning I can now swap at the best prices directly from my Ledger wallet. So seriously, if you're a DeFi trader and you're worried about the security risks of centralized exchanges, but you also don't want to scour dozens of DEXs just to find the best price, you have to check out Paraswap. So head on over to paraswap.io slash blockcrunch. I'd also love to take a moment to talk about the HBAR Foundation. Now, if you approach me one to two years ago, I would tell you I'm really skeptical of layer one systems outside of Ethereum. But in the past 12 months, I started to notice billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of users flocking to new blockchains left and right. And then I realized there's an actual market gap being filled. And I always love to support projects who support builders. And one of those projects is Hedera Hashgraph. Hedera is an enterprise grade public network with its own crypto asset called HBAR. And the HBAR Foundation has launched with an initial budget of over $2 billion to provide entrepreneurs with the funding and ecosystem support needed to quickly build and deploy new applications on the Hedera Hashgraph network. The HBAR Foundation is eager to find builders in DeFi, NFTs, gaming, sustainability, and all sectors. So if you are a builder, a developer, or a creator with an idea, visit hbarfoundation.org to learn more. I'd love to talk a little bit about Notional. If you follow the show for long enough, you know I'm pretty excited about fixed rate products. Notional Finance is the leading fixed rate borrowing and lending protocol, and they've just released a major upgrade. With Notional, you can not only borrow and lend at fixed rates for up to one year now, but liquidity providers also have a pretty good opportunity. Thanks to an integration with Compound and a liquidity mining program, LPs can actually earn interest, liquidity fees, and token liquidity mining incentives as well. We've talked with Teddy from Notional recently, and as a happy investor as well, I've been pretty impressed with how the team is building this critical infrastructure that will help onboard the next billion users to DeFi. So you can check it out today at notional.finance slash blockcrunch. Yeah, and I'm really interested in the game theory aspect of this because I remember back when Sushi launched a vampire attack on Uniswap, people were saying, well, Uniswap actually has the upper hand because they hasn't launched a token yet. So after Sushi is migrated, Uniswap can then launch a token. So whoever comes last in this kind of vampire attack game actually wins. I'm curious about, you know, how you think about the game theory of this. Like, um, what is, is, is there like an ideal strategy to launch a vampire attack to make sure, you know, you retain that liquidity? Mm. An ideal strategy to retain that liquidity. Um, so I think you should go for the DPI index. Uh, I would I would start off with that one. Um, I would definitely get indexes from all of the platforms just to expand the knowledge to see how other people are doing it. So you can give us feedback for how we can continuously improve um, specifically on the UX and integrations layer. This is what we're mostly interested in too. And afterwards, just participate in the gamification element and see if your migrated index, if you would like to edit it, you can edit the underlying. So don't envision these assets as fixed as soon as you migrate, you're able to edit and then participate in the Enzo platform. And when you launch a vampire attack, do you what is the logistics like? Do you have to reach out to each of the team and talk to them and work together? Or is it more kind of just like, surprise, <laughs> we're coming for your liquidity? Um... <laughs> So we, we haven't approached any of the teams. Um, we have now, after the press release, just to say no bad blood, um, fair game, let's have some fun together. If we can work together in the future, let's see what works out. 
regarding the communication prior to happening, we wanted to keep it as silent as possible. The reason why for the migration scripts, we have some measures in place just in case uh, they do upgrades, but we didn't want this to get into wider knowledge at the beginning. So we could kind of build, see what works, what doesn't work. And a great example, indexed uh, their governance, delisted about two, three indexes, which was great for us just prior to the attack because we had these in our migration script. So we didn't contact the teams <laughs> prior to being in the, the public knowledge, but, it, but I see this as a, a fun experience for all. It doesn't need to be a battle. Um, if we were to simply do a very basic UI and just migrate through very simple UI, I don't think it'd be reasonable. But as we build all of this gamification, we've got NFTs, it's great visuals, then, then I think it's fun for everyone. Absolutely. And you also wrote a blog post about DeFi 2.0. And for people who are not aware, you can check out our episode with uh, Fei, uh, or, which is one of the DeFi 2.0 projects. But one, one of the core concepts in DeFi 2.0 is this idea of protocol controlled liquidity, where instead of having users deposit liquidity and they can withdraw at any time, you're actually making a trade with the protocol where you deposit your liquidity and in return, the protocol maybe gives you their native token uh, in equivalent value at the time of transfer. So given that you know protocols make uh, start to own more of their own liquidity during this do you think this concept of a vampire attack is mostly a defi 1.0 concept is it going to be like an obsolete thing moving down the road or will, will it still happen will, will it still happen to different protocols i think it will continuously happen and i think people should promote it um because it improves the products ultimately if you need to constantly build con continuously iterate um yeah, with, with DeFi 2.0, with Enso itself, you can have the LP tokens inside of the strategy. You can then have these LP tokens um, sent to other platforms as well. So Enso could be a one route where you can manage all of these LP tokens that are then leased to the other protocols. So having one unified place for doing this. So an example could be one, one strategy that has all of the own bonds, and then you can have one entrance route instead of getting all of the different bonds. I think this will always happen. It's happening within banks. If you move from UBS, you move to Raiffeisen, you get this credit. And I think we should promote it. It's composability. And this is what Ethereum was built for, interacting with each other's platforms. Yeah, and I feel like users are the ones who ultimately benefit because when you migrate between different protocols, you get all the new incentives and you also get products that are pushed to innovate faster and create better features and i guess we, we started to see that with uh with uniswap and sushi i'm actually surprised there hasn't been more more vampire attacks i'm curious Same. if you have any thoughts about you know why why haven't there, there been as many vampire attacks i think it's very risky you put yourself in a very vulnerable position by doing this um like your question earlier do you think people will do this to us yes i think they will and we should promote this I think that's prim primarily the reason nobody wants to create bad blood. However, this isn't bad blood. This is just how it's done. This is composability. I hope a lot more people do this because it makes you think about your product in different ways. It's a great competitor analysis, um, really doing the competitor analysis and going through all of their contracts, how it exactly works, how you can do the migration, how you differentiate yourself from all of the other uh, competitors. Yeah, most definitely. And you also mentioned earlier that uh, actually before we recorded that uh, you guys have been working on version two for about four or five months now. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? I know there's some excitement around uh, being able to kind of bundle arbitrary contract calls. So can you kind of describe what's going on there and what can users do with it? Sure. So this is where the fun begins. Um, if the vampire attack wasn't fun already. Um, so Ethereum was built in a way where you can bundle multiple smart contracts together and call multiple smart contracts together, right? So for example, you have one protocol doing a, a protocol control value, one creating strategies, one doing indexes, one having a social network. By doing this, everyone kind of creates their own integrations with other platforms, right? So you hire developers, they have to build integrations into Element. They have to build integrations into Curve. They need to read all their docs and understand exactly how it works. Now, this isn't scalable in the long term. This is who can hire the, the most developers, and it's an integration race, ultimately. 
which in the long term doesn't build good products. It's only who can integrate with the most people. So with version two, we've built a generalized solution where you're able to paste any smart contract address, select the functions that you want to call, then paste it another smart contract address, and then you can nest all of these calls together. So an example could be paste an, uh, uh, an address of a farm that only deployed one hour ago, select the stake function or deposit function, then in your next call, you can take the return value of maybe your wrapped stake to then put it into another farm. So by having this open and transparent system where any smart contract call can be done and nested together, then it allows other projects to focus on the product itself. And it opens up the whole world of um, Ethereum smart contract calls. It was very interesting to kind of come to this point because we knew we were going to hit this actually. But regardless, we went down this path of integrations because we wanted to launch earlier. However, by doing this, we've done a couple of integrations and we realized this is not good long term. We need a solution for ourselves for building arbitrary smart contract calls. We, we call these recipes. Now, similar to token lists on Uniswap, we'll have recipe lists where you can see all the other creators, all of the other recipes that have been created and their calls underneath. Now, this opens up the floodgates for what could and cannot happen. Um, a lot of common sense will need to come from using this sort of um, tool. People will create recipes that contain honeypots, that contain fake farms. Now, this is why you would need the governance on top for then verified lists. You'll need projects for verifying their recipes itself that they use within the platform that then creates a trusted layer on top. And yeah, it, we see the world in a way where it should be fully open. Any smart contract call should, should be done. It will be very interesting to see how other projects react to this, if they will adapt their product or they will continue on this integration race. Yeah, so we've spoken about, I guess, two big things that uh, people maybe a year or two ago might have thought were sources of moats for DeFi products. So one is liquidity, the other is like exclusive partnerships or integrations, right? And we yeah. see projects like Cream, Alpha Finance doing a lot of like uh, partnerships and integrations. But based on what you guys are building, it seems like not only will liquidity no longer be a moat uh, because of the vampire attack, uh, and integrations may not be a moat as well. So in your mind, over the long term, what is um, the moat for a DeFi product? What do you mean by moat exactly? What do you mean in terms that? of, um, I guess, the protective defensive moat that allows them to retain users, uh, some sort of positive feedback loop that uh, helps them retain the users over time um, without always being at risk of um, you know, being forked or having their, their, their users taken easily. Mm. I think it's down to the community and I think it's down to the product. And I also think a lot of it's down to UX. I think we can improve within the DeFi community on what user experience we have. Now, people will use this tool underneath. We, we promote it actually. But by creating it ourselves, we can enable a better product for ourselves, social trading applications, for people to build strategies, for people to now go and literally farms that were deployed five minutes ago, if it was or not verified on Etherscan. And that's where the real alpha is nowadays. You can have people who have the best alpha, but they only have $1,000, $2,000 to their name. With a tool like this, they can now profit from it. So they can build the recipe, they can bring the recipe into their strategy, and then other people can invest into it. Now, these people can play not only with $1,000, but they can play with $20 million now if people invest into their strategy. And they can take a, a percentage off the top. Regarding forking this, yeah, I, I think it will happen and we promote it. Again, I think it comes down to the community and the constant feedback, the constant iterations. And I also think it comes down to the vision of the team. So the teams came up with this idea, we've implemented it, we can see where the next steps are going to be. If it's just raw forks, then yeah, they, they can keep building on top and maybe they have the same vision, but it's not the same end goal as to where we want to get to. That's fascinating. And I love to kind of usually wrap our discussions on a very, very big question, which is, you know, for, for you, what does success for Enso actually look like? So if you look down, you know, five, 10 years from now, what, what is success for Enso? Sure. I want a platform that people can use every day. 
is pretty much it. So I want a platform that I can use. So this was started about a year ago where I would send Ether to my friends for them to manage. So they would find low market cap coins. They would use my Ether and <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all do it. They would buy it and um, they would manage it and I would trust it. And I thought, why can't we just have a tool that there's no trusted element for this? So the end goal is allowing anyone to create a strategy for people investing into each other's and for managing it. I see that we probably will have a mobile app in the future. This is where the industry is going, in my personal opinion. So the Robinhood, but for social trading on the, on the phone. This right now is only built for Ethereum, but I would like to build it open for any layer one coin. So you can have a portfolio or a strategy comprised of other chains within one place. And yeah, I, I think it will be a, a tool used by a lot of people. And I just want to build something that people use um, that makes sense. You know, a lot of people say, oh, what are you invested into? And well, here's my strategy. Just <laughs> invest into it. It's very easy this way. Um, and instead of trusting my friends with Ether, I can just directly invest into their, their strategy. Absolutely. That, that's a really compelling vision. And you know, that's exactly why I smart investors as well. So I'm super excited to, to have people check this out. Um, so for people who want to you know, partake in this vampire attack and witness what is happening, or just want to be a part of the Enso community, what are the best channels for them to do this? Yep. So join our Discord. It's very new. Um, we're always open to advice as to how to um, improve the community. We have feedback loops as well for questions. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm in the Discord, I'll answer you. If you join our tel uh, Telegram, it's not as active. We recommend Discord um, on the Twitter as well. Um, you'll see most of the posts on Discord about five minutes before it gets released on Twitter. So that's where all the news comes out. And just, yeah, help us build a product that makes sense where you can collaboratively invest with your friends, with a DAO, with a multi-sig, and tell us what features that you would like, um, because ultimately the community is the users and be part of the, the, the future and have some fun with the vampire attack. It's, it's really good fun. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm super excited to see how this goes. So once again, thank you so much for coming on, Conrad. This has been really fun. Cool. Thanks very much for having me, Jason.